Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final session for this conference. Um, we are in the three to four o'clock block here, developing your agritourism experience. And we're going to start with Lindsay Paschel from Cornell Cooperative Extension. After that, the Yak It To Me workshop has been canceled. So we won't have the Yak It To Me, but uh, we will move into my workshop, which is the final one in this block um, with the Farm-Based Education Network, It's Raining Resources. We'll move that up to the 3.40 timeframe. So we will get started with Lindsay. Thanks. Okay. So my session's on bringing an international agritourism experience home to your agritourism community. So my name is Lindsay Paggio. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension's Harvest New York team as an ag business development marketing specialist. I'm also a farmer too. So I'm actually gonna use my farming experience and my extension experience to actually talk about how I established Adirondack View Vineyard and Lavender. I'm a graduate of SUNY Plattsburgh State University of New York at Plattsburgh State uh, with a bachelor's degree in business marketing, a master's degree in administration and leadership. And one of the really exciting parts I had when I was at SUNY Plattsburgh was I got to study abroad for a semester. I spent a whole semester in England and was able to travel all over Europe. I went to Munich, Vienna, Venice, Rome, and Paris during my spring break, my senior year of college. And it just brought a love for travel experience. So during that experience, I was able to visit many different landmarks, uh, farms, estates. And then from there, it just allowed me to travel back to Europe, basically almost yearly to visit my friends. I was able to go to Australia and see the wine industry down to Mexico and see um, like kind of how tequila was made. So I've had these experience like internationally, also in the United States traveling all over, also into Canada that has brought a, just a love for travel. And I'm always looking at what different business venture I could potentially do. I think a couple of years ago, um, there was an interest in, I came across lavender as a potential for starting a business. And my, my mom, dad, and I have looked at lavender operations all over. We've, I've seen lavender operations in Europe, but also in the United States. So my parents did a road trip from New York state all the way out to Washington state and visited lavender operations and spent a lot of time interacting with the operators and learning about how can we do this? How can we potentially bring this back to New York State, which does ha does have some lavender operations, but there's none in my location in the Adirondack Mountains. So I own Adirondack View Vineyard and Lavender. It's located in Keysville, New York. We are in a USDA zone four, which is not an ideal location to be growing lavender. Um, so we had to do a lot of research on how we we're going to grow this crop. So we also grow grapes, sunflowers, zinnias, pumpkins, blueberries, and black raspberries. But our main focus is around lavender and then also around you pick sunflowers and grapes and zinnias. We do have a, fall, a small farm store that all the products are made on the farm by myself, my mom, Dana, and my father, Ken. We have a bunch of different events on the farm from uh, Kids Day's events. We have a really cute Kids Day events that we started this year that we're doing yearly called Fairies in the Lavender. We also do yoga in the lavender. We have an event space, which is basically a tent, 20 by 40. I'm all about um, starting a business and starting it slowly and building it up to size. So we're starting slowly, 20 by 40 tent, porta potties, electricity, picnic tables. We've held a number of bridal showers baby showers, weddings, retirement parties, and birthday parties. And it's all about for us slow expanding. And so next year we're expanding into more workshops. But the big thing is when it starts to having a business, it's important to have a short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals and a business plan. Without those, it's going to be very difficult to succeed. And the best part is it's your farm, so you can change your short-term, mid-terms, and long-term goals whenever you want. So Basically, with my farm, what's unique about it is we're growing a unique crop. We're the only ones in the Adirondack Park growing lavender. The closest operation is over the border in, um, in Quebec, or at least about a three-hour drive away from um, our location. We also 
have a beautiful view that includes the Adirondack Mountains. We are not trying to copy France with grapevines or lavender, but we, you know, we're trying to bring something unique to our area. And our, my big thing about the property is having a place that is welcoming to the community and that's well landscaped because that's what thing is when I, as a traveler, I love looking at beautiful properties. We have a farm store that everything's produced on the property. So I actually make a variety of different lavender products. It does have a, you know, diverse products in the store. Uh, my mom makes clothing items. My dad makes woodworkings. I wrote a children's book this last year called Fairies and Lavender and the Boy. So I'm always adding different products. And what's neat about our farm store is right now, I'm here at the conference, my farm store is open to the public. It is self-service. It's not something that's for everyone or every location, but it works in our community. Um, we're a tight community, a lot of trust. So it, it does work for us. And we're actually open seven days a week from May 1st, October 31st from eight till 5 p.m. And I think that's actually been really welcoming to the community. We do a lot of collaborations with photographers. We allow photographers on our property, which um, has been a really help with um, marketing our, our operation. We work with one photographer that's allowed to come on the property after hours and they do Milky Way photography and it has really helped boost our business. We are part of the Plain Air Festival in Keysville. I have a friend who comes in and she does yoga in the lavender. It's such a unique experience for our local community to have people to be coming to do yoga in a different location than a just no yoga studio. So now I bring it down to like my, my important, my extension point of view of looking at an operation is having objectives and methods. So when we started this business was how to find unique agritourism experience to bring back to my area that was unique from everybody else. Cause I don't want to be copying what my neighbor is doing. I want something that's completely different. Affordable to the community. Um, I have a passion for that. Everybody is able to afford everything in my store. So I have products that are a dollar to $150. Um, I want people just to be able to be able to afford it because as we know with COVID it's a local communities that sustained us. The tourists weren't there. And we do welcome tours, we love them, but the community ends up coming first for us. And then the four P's of marketing. So this is my, this is my way of looking at how to find a unique agritourism experience is look at your current and your future crops, look at your, your time commitment and your lifestyle. Do you have a lot of time commitment to be taking care of livestock or your vegetable garden? We picked a more of a perennial crop just because um, you know, there's, I don't have to take care of it every single day with lavender. It does need maintenance, same thing with the grapes, but it's something that, you know, I can be working, working full time and I can do my farm stuff, um, when I can, I look at, I looked at many different operations. So like the example was looking at, um, you know, operations all throughout my travel. But then when I found something that I really was passionate about is really spend the time researching. I just included a lot of my travel experience with trying to find something unique and then research the growing conditions in the market. We knew that we were going to struggle with growing uh, lavender. Um, we've struggled with growing cold, cold climate grapes too over the years. So we were used to bringing into a, you know, a difficult crop into the, to the property. But the big thing with the growing, um, with the lavenders, we knew we were going to have potentially every single year plants die out. So we just have a you know contingency plan that we need to continue to replant and just kind of move forward. Um, we looked at, you know, we always were looking at our short-term, mid-term, long-term goals in our business plan. So the reason why we're able to make this affordable to the community to be able to, to offer products that uh, you know, from a dollar to a dollar fifty is, you know, we kept it slowly developing um, this property over time. So keeping our startup costs as low as possible, we've started small, we are expanding yearly, and we, you know, we've made it affordable for a local community and they really appreciate that we're there. And we do have tourists that find us from you know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, from Quebec. It's amazing how just word of mouth, um, really support from our Chamber of Commerce and different marketing agencies really has pushed forward with the business. 
And then I always look at the four P's of marketing that I really like to, when I'm ever teaching a marketing class for a cooperative extension is really focusing on my price for my product. So pricing and be able to support the local community, looking at other operations of what they're selling their lavender products across the country, across the globe, um, and making sure that it is in the, in the correct price range, but still affordable for that local community. And then having um, products that, you know, are different and have a different variety and that are, you know, made on the farm has really been helpful for us. And, you know, our promotion for our farm is social media, word of mouth and um, newspapers. And our place of sales is, it's great. It's, it's local as it can be, it's right on the farm. Um, some results from doing this is, you know, we have the only lavender farm um, currently in operation in the Adirondack Mountains. You know, we we are a self-service farm stand, so all products are created by the you know, owner family. We offer uh, four weeks of you pick lavender that's open to the public, and that brings a lot of traffic in because it's such a unique experience. And you know, we do do self-service. You pick sunflowers, zinnias, and grapes, and that basically is from. Uh, July until you know it's going on right now um, and into the fall. So strategies to evaluate this is working for us is we track all of our sales from May 1st to October um, 31st. And you know one of the things that I really like to push is having some type of platform to be able to track these sales. Um, there's many different platforms out there. So and then we also track that our main sales start at the end of June into the fall. And it's really about that UPIC for us. The UPIC operation brings in our, you know, our farmers, I mean, brings in our customers and those customers, you know, do the UPIC, but they also buy products in the store. So, you know, there might only be, you know, $10 in sunflower sales, but then there might be $50 in buying products in the store, um, which is it's just amazing to watch the how tracking sales every day, you see what it's gonna be like. Uh, we evaluate each crops to concentrate or, ex or expand or cut. So we used to go grow garlic. It just falls in the wrong time of our growing season. It's at this time when our, our mm -hmm. lavender is in bloom and our lavender is our concentration. So we had to get rid of garlic and plus it wasn't making the sales that we wanted. And then we really focus in on customer feedback. Our you know, we've had a lot of positive feedback from our, our local community and support. And then yeah. some conclusions and lessons learned. We're finding finding something unique brings um, interest in sales. So once you find something unique, people are gonna wanna copy the experience, which is to me, I actually look at it as, as humbling because I, you know, if another lavender operation opens up down the road, then we must be doing something right. Um, you know, we have looked at the operations out in Washington state, and there's a lot of operations very close to each other and they make it work when it comes down to it. Uh, people want something to do when they visit your farm, which leads to increased sales um, in the farm store. And that's just agritourism and make sure the price point works for your local um, customers. Uh, follow some operations on social media has been um, amazing. So I follow operations all in Europe that do lavender and all across the United States. And I've also developed a strong friendship with other similar operations to be able to share ideas back and forth. I, you know, I try to encourage people not to, you know, go down the road and copy your neighbor and expect that you're going to get, you know, a friendly welcoming. But if you find, you know, people that are doing similar operations across the country or across the world, people are willing to share information. And so this is my contact information. And this is my son, Liam and Logan. So the older one, Logan, uh, Liam's two and a half years old, Logan's seven months. And I think that's the reason why I'm doing the farming is, you know, I work for Cornell Parsons, but I do the farming too, so that they're gonna have something to pass on to that generation down the road. Does anybody have any questions?
I offer an experience. I'm a guide and I partner with landholders uh, and it's fairly uh, new for me, um, my guide service. And I'm wondering what would be a good process to assess, um, you know, if I'm only getting 60% of the event attendance or the frequency of attendees that I would like, you know, you mentioned the four P's, like, is there a way to figure out, you know, which area would be, you know, if it's the price point or if it's just something a little bit too weird for people, you know, like how do you go about figuring out what you might need to adjust? Yeah, I would, I would potentially like survey past customers, but then also one of the things like I've wanted to run workshops and mm -hmm. I've asked around in where my, where my customer base is, my local community. So if yours is going to be more of like an you know, international or regional, trying to find out what people's price point would be where I would start. And then how are people finding out about your operation? Um, but I feel like sometimes, you know, you look at things of, you know, a higher price point brings in a certain type of people, but it's not sustainable over time. So in my area, the local community is absolutely wonderful, but they're not going to be paying, you know, they're not going to pay $15 to go pick up a, a, a bouquet of lavender when it comes down to it. They're going to pay $6 and come back every single weekend or buy multiple bouquets. It's just what's going to attract the people to come to your operation, but make sure it's going to work for you, you know, your operation, your operating costs to do such a thing. Um, yeah, you actually kind of hit on some of my questions, but I was wondering if you looked at the breakdown of like how much revenue is coming from tourists and how much is coming from the local community. And then you know, to what you just kind of stated that how you might balance those different revenue streams by different offerings. Um, so for right now, it's basically the local community is where our, our majority of our revenue is coming from, but over time, so we're at the point, so we have 2000 lavender plants in the ground and we are, you know, if you saw my garage and how much lavender is hanging, you'd be like, you need to get more people in there to pick. So we are going to start, since we know that we're at the scale that we can start moving into expanding to bring, try to bring the tourists in. Cause we're only 45 minutes from, from Lake Placid. We're an hour and a half from Montreal. We're an hour and a half from Burlington. So we are at a, like kind of in a prime location that to bring people into those, those tourist people into our operation. I mean, we do have people that find our operation that are staying in the Adirondack park because um, we've got some good relationships from, to, from Airbnbs that are from New York, New York City, from New Jersey, from Pennsylvania, from other parts of New York State that wouldn't have heard of us through either word of mouth or, you know, have heard about us through social media at this point. So a couple of quick questions here from our guests online. Hopefully it's quick uh, to answer. How do you compensate your photographers what is the profile of your visitors and how many people work for you? Okay. So I'm going to scare you when I say how many people work for me. It's my mom, dad, and I. So from either from, from working full time. So I work Monday through Friday. I, you know, I'm taking making products into the evening. Um, on my weekends, I spend the majority of my time I spent with my children but I, my mom watches them and I go out and I run around and do as much as I can on the farm. And then my father does, you know, a lot of the mowing. So we've been, we have a really good balance. Um, I have brought in somebody to help me on those UPIC weekends, um, but it's basically been just the three of us. Uh, the majority, I think our, like our customer profile is all over. I mean, it's basically from from the kids for the fairies and the lavender, which was the most remarkable thing I've seen before, little kids running around with fairy wings on, to, you know, 94 year olds out there picking lavender with their sons. So it's been really, really interesting. Um, and then what was the other part of it? Was it? No, I don't pay the photographers. And that's been something I've looked at a lot of operations. Um, I've seen, some operations will take like a deposit of like $75 and, you know, ask them to send photos back for marketing purposes and they get $75 back. I know operations that do $50, but at this point in time, I just basically say, you just need to tag us in a social media post. And that's, and they can only do it between eight and 5 PM when the property is open. And then the one who does the, 
those nice Milky Way photos. He's a different, just a different person that I live in. That's a friend and he's allowed to come after hours and that middle of the night, which is kind of weird for somebody to show up on your property at two o'clock in the morning, but he's from um, the Albany area. So two hours away. And when he takes and promotes it on social media, it really helps our operation. So I'm using a lot of that trade balance at this point. It might change over time, but um, that's kind of how we do it. Thanks, Lindsay. I, I love this concept and your photographs are wonderful. So, and you, it seems like you've built in, you know, designed a lot of it to be able to have very little staff because the farm stores self-serve. I mean, even you pick. Yeah is kind of a self-serve thing. Maybe you have to be there to manage the crowd and take the bouquet payment, but they're out in the fields by themselves, right? Yeah, the the you pick lavender, that's the only time I, I require that we do it those four weekends on Saturday and Sunday because you have to cut it a certain way. And you can show somebody how to cut lavender and tell them not to cut into the woody part in the plant and they still will cut into your woody part of the plant, mm -hmm. which causes, you know, potential damage. But everything else, like the sunflowers, the zinnias, the grapes, um, it's just, it's self-service that we do. And that really led to my real question was how, what's your intention to weave in the education component? Because I really think, it, you know, agritourism is giving them some call to action to go back home. And if they're not going to grow a lavender field, what what do they get from respecting your land and yeah. and in the environment? Yeah. So what I've brought away from this conference and just experience on other farms is we're going to start, I'm going to take and have a big signage done on how to grow lavender about the farm. Um, we're this weekend, we have an open farm weekend that's put on by Adirondack Harvest, um, part of the our cuisine trails that are starting, the Adirondack Cuisine Trail Network. So I've started putting together information on how to use lavender for culinary purposes, because that's one thing that the general public doesn't know that you can cook with lavender and it to make some of the most amazing treats that I've ever had, so. One more online. <clears throat> Which tools do you use to gather customer information about the products to um, determine how to change your sales mix, like the garlic example? Um, so I think what I do is I look at my, you know, my platform that I do for tracking my sales to make a determination which products need to come and go. Cause I, you know, I'm putting the, pro I'm not, it's me putting those products out in the store so I can make a determination if things are selling or not selling. And then a lot of it comes back to, you know, those you pick weekends when I'm, you know, interacting with people. So I was making this lavender mist. I was not sure if that was actually something that people were that was going to move forward because every you can get lavender mist and air freshener and in, in a lot of different places and they love it they just like can you keep making this so a lot of is just that you know personal interaction i have with the customers but you know i also get a lot of interaction to people writing comments or like thank you so we get a lot of thank yous for letting me well come to your property so thank you so much lindsay um, Lindsay's email is on the board and are you here through the end of the conference? If you have, conference so, okay. So yep. if there's further questions, definitely find Lindsay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, if you were in the room right when we were getting started, we shared that the other presenter who's going in the middle of this session um, is not able to make it. So the yak presentation is not on. Unfortunately, I know. <laughs> Do, are you an aspiring yak grower? Um, so we're gonna move into this um, in COVID, post, not post COVID, but as we move through COVID, I decided to leave PowerPoint in the past. I'm, I'm your presenter for the next session. My name is Vera, Simon Nobes. Um, I decided to leave PowerPoint in the past and go with this kind of strange video format. So I'm sorry, Andrew. I know I'm throwing you for a loop, but we'll see how it goes. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, I think I have like an antique here with a flip chart. Not a lot of people are using those I noticed, but <laughs> I was motivated because I really don't like being the expert in the room. I really wanna be here to hear from all of you. Um, so this workshop is called It's Raining Resources. Uh, we are sort of closing out our session together in a way, or our workshop here on agritourism. So I have a couple goals for this session. Um, one is to not really be the expert in the room, but to make some space for you all to share what, is been, what has been inspiring to you all as you've been on your agritourism journeys and been in your careers with agritourism. And the second um, goal for me is to sort of uh, acknowledge how much information we have been taking in over the last two and a half days. It's incredible. And a lot of it is just like very cerebral. And I think that um, probably many of us have gone into the field of agritourism or educate farm-based education because we learn in many different ways. We learn through doing with work when we're hands-on on our farms. Um, we learn through watching. We learn through sensing with all of our senses as we walk through a garden or a farm. So I just want to acknowledge that we're having a lot of intelligence coming into our minds, and we're going to try to access actually some other ways of knowing as well in this session, one of which is by um, thinking about who some of our mentors are and actually sort of calling them into this space. Um, but first, <laughs> we will just take a minute to just share kind of where I'm coming from. So I think I said, my name is Vera. I work at Shelburne Farms. We're an educational nonprofit educating for a sustainable future. Um, this is straight from our website. So you can see that information there as well. But we're a historic farm. We're also a current working farm on 1400 acres. We make farmstead cheddar cheese from our brown Swiss cows. Um, we raise lamb for wool and for meat. Um, we have a restaurant on the farm. We do educational programming through summer camps and through field trips and family programs. And we also uh, run uh, what we call informally teacher summer camp. So in the summertime, you'll find hundreds of teachers on the property who are there to think about how education for sustainability fits into what they're doing in their classrooms. And we have a staff of educators who um, are looking, at, we call ourselves professional development facilitators or professional learning facilitators. And we're there to use our whole farm campus as a campus for learning for teachers and of course for people of all ages. Um, the Farm-Based Education Network is a project of Shelburne Farms. So we have um, people from around the world who are interested in farm-based education. And I can tell from the conversations that I've heard at this workshop that um, there's so many intersections with farm-based education and agritourism, how you all think of it. Um, I mean, one could say that they're like pretty much the same, really overlapping because um, education is so important to our uh, agritourism enterprises. So the uh, in coming to this conference, I knew I'd be making a ton of new connections. And I actually was thinking as we all are making new connections, sometimes it's really nice to actually think back to the people who have guided us to where we are today to balance out all the new energy and the new relationships that we forming that we're forming together. So the person I'm thinking of is Violetta Sandoval, who is a chef um, in the Bay Area, I used to work with her and she is a person who taught me a lot about the power of food and the power of cooking together as community building. And I still to this day will think of her sometimes when I'm in a kitchen with kids or when I'm um, on in our forest cooking over an open fire with a group of kids um, on our farm. So maybe we can just take a couple minutes or even just 30 seconds to think about a mentor who has shaped you and where you've got and where you are today. And then it's, um, if anybody's interested in sharing, you're welcome to, to share. Does anybody have one to share? You can say it and I'll repeat if you want. Or, or yeah, go ahead to the mic, thanks. I'm big on hands-on farm education, not so much technology. So mine is an organization. And when you first started talking, I thought, hmm, I don't know. I have people I develop things with 
collectively, but uh, the Putney School in Putney, Vermont is a farm-based college prep uh, school. And they hired me to run their environmental program and to coordinate uh, connections with their farm and the college-based curriculum. And that changed my life forever. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Does somebody else want to share a mentor who has shaped you? Uh, anybody online, Andrew? Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, hello, I'm Alexander from Innsbruck, uh, University of Innsbruck. Um, it might not fit so much, but uh, from the academic side, it was my professor who is a positive constructivist huh. and you you just enjoy this. If somebody really tries and, and have this positive uh, feeling and for, po positive way to see things in, in life. Yeah? And also from the academic side, it doesn't make a, a it really makes a difference. If you read a paper, which is written by a positive constructivist, then somebody is trying to do, to find the negative points. Yeah? yeah. So I really like that. Thank you. That's great. Well, thanks. All right. And so I now want to just turn to you all and again, ask you a question about where you all go for inspiration when you're coming up with agritourism ideas. If Lindsay was still in the room, I think she would probably surface as a resource right now too, because she's um, a wealth of, of, of information. Um, and now you can turn to like three people near you, or if you choose to do this on your own, you could do it on your own, but definitely take out a piece of paper and just think about a few places where you go when you're either reinventing something that you're doing. So we all know about these cycles of looking at feedback and adapting and then trying something new. Um, so when you're adapting something that you do, or if you're trying something new for the very first time, what's a resource that's been helpful to you? Um, our goal is to actually get those up on uh, the flip chart paper so that we all can take some of those home with us. So I'll set my timer for um, four minutes and we'll check back in.
So that's one thing I do. 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 Take about one more minute. All right, so wrap up the conversation you're in. Come back together when you finish your, your sentence. If y'all can hear my voice, give yourself butterfly wings. <laughs> yeah. If y'all can hear my voice, give yourself some cow horns. <laughs> nice. Cool. Um, so what did you all share? I trust that your conversations went beyond just the question. And that's great because that's what we're all here for. Um, but just in the um, effort of populating our flip chart here, where do y'all turn for new ideas in agritourism? You can shout them out and I'll write them down. Ah. Anything in particular on social media? Is there a certain page or something that sticks out to you? Are you about Instagram? Yeah. yeah. A lot of people follow where you can Awesome. So social media, it's in, uh, Instagram specifically because it's photo rich and you can follow a hashtag, hashtag agritourism. Yeah. Great. Something else? Uh, just doing like tours of other people's facilities that are in the midst of what they're like major. Yep, cool. Tours of others. I'll read these out to the virtual audience. Yeah, Sam? Hey, I'm lucky. I can go to Shelter Farms and Gary shows me what to do. She's had great, fantastic videos. I was just around. And also, uh, Lisa Chase is on webinars. Yeah. Yeah. I have to 
it was about to keep the uh, customer key. So mm -hmm. I had to be keeping my, my customer key. Uh -huh. Thank you all. Oh, yeah, thanks. Awesome. So for the people who are virtually with us, we have social media, Instagram, particularly photos, including hashtag agritourism, listening to our students, listening to our customers. This conference, including the webinars, which were hosted leading up to this conference, tours of other farms, other operators, coming to Shelburne Farms, you all are welcome. <laughs> um, the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Tourism Association, NAFTMA, another um, producer group for agritourism, and YouTube. Great list. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide, Andrew. Um, so my favorite resources will skew, um, skew heavily towards the educational side of things and will help us answer questions like, hey, I have a group of third graders coming from the town next door. Their teacher wants them to do something with pigs and soil. What can you do? <laughs> you can go to one of these websites and get some ideas. The Farm-Based Education Network, this is the project that I coordinate. And uh, we've been doing a lot of community building online. Um, some uh, share outs from different programs, almost like spotlighting different programs from around the country. A lot of anti-racism work, what it looks like to be um, anti-racist educators in, on farms. And we also have in-person workshops, which almost always take place at Shelburne Farms. So you all are welcome to um, look at our calendar and see what's upcoming there, and then come participate in a hands-on workshop where we are very much balancing play and just exploring together, putting ourselves in the shoes of the students who might be coming on our school, school field trips, um, reflection time and networking time to really learn from everybody in the room. Uh, we can go to the next section. This is a website, Lisa Chase is sort of the brain behind this. Um, and it's a really great hub for a lot of best practices guides, best practices in agritourism, which we could definitely um, question whether that's the right term. I, I guess promising practices is maybe what we might call it because there's no one best practice. Um, and then we have other resources on this site, like a lot of safety resources. And we're calling out other great sites like the Rutger, Rutgers um, has a lot of really awesome checklists that are helpful for agritourism operators. And those are all accessible through this website. Thanks, Andrew. kidsgardening.org is wonderful for finding tips for growing a garden, designing an accessible pathway through a school garden or a community garden, also um, all sorts of activities. And I just wanna remind everyone that even if an um, activity might be labeled that it's for a garden or it's coming from a garden-based um, association or organization, a lot of what is like the essence of those lessons are really applicable to our farms as well. The next one is the Edible Schoolyard Project. Has it, have people heard of that before? Yeah. Similarly, they have a nice resource section where you can search like a grade level if you have a specific audience in mind and maybe a, um, a subject. Uh, they also have good professional development, especially if you're in, a, in the more farm to school world and working on um, school food and education. Then I just wanted to pause and talk about um, a couple resources that we have. These were produced by Shelburne Farms. This is an early childhood education resource. So like pre-K through maybe third grade, this is uh, elementary age. And these resources are all um, full of activities. And we encourage you to take these activities, to choose the ones that you like, and then really make them your own. You can change what you you know, do, you don't have to follow something directly how it's written, but really make it your own and then let us know how you've changed it and how it's been working for you on your farm. Um, I also put this picture of the adorable mailbox because one of my favorite um, activities that I've seen, which comes from a mentor in the Vermont uh, farm-based education community called named Scout Proft. Um, Scout, I 
I think Scout sort of invented this idea of having activities stashed inside mailboxes with mailboxes mounted at different points around her farm. So it allowed people to have a self ex self guided explore um, and find something like maybe a a color wheel could be inside there. So you could take this out and do some matching in the forest or matching in a garden, and you could keep these inside a mailbox and they stay relatively safe and um, accessible for people. Oh yeah. So this basically takes us to the end of our time. And in this, in this session being kind of the closing session for this conference, I actually wanted to give you all an option to write a card. I didn't have postcards, but I have real cards to yourself um, to kind of remind you of some of the learning that has been, has been happening for you during this conference. I think um, if you're anything like me, you might be taking in a lot and not necessarily making a lot of time for reflection. And it's, it's really important because in those reflection spaces is really how we learn and can think about how to adapt what we're learning here to our specific sites. So the idea is that you could choose to write, your, write to yourself about a resource that you've learned. That resource could be something you picked up on somebody's table, or it could be a person or conversation you've had with somebody. And you might want to, um, what did I say on the slide? I made this a while ago. <laughs> what is one resource you wanna share with someone? Um, and what's one resource that you wanna spend more time with yourself? So I'm gonna actually pass out cards to you all. Your job is to write yourself a card and then come up at the end and just put it on the um, little black table there. Um, you also have to address the envelopes to yourselves so that in two weeks or so, when I get back to my, um, when I get around to it, <laughs> I will be able to mail them to you and just provide this little reminder of what this experience has been for you all. Um, before we do that, do you all have any questions? I guess I could take a few questions now and then we could close officially with that exercise. I definitely wanna just make myself available to anyone who's interested in talking more about farm-based education. Um, and I love having one-on-one -on -one conversations on the phone or giving you information about workshops that might be happening as part of the network or through our partners or at, at Shelburne Farms directly. Thank you all. Um, are we good in the chat? Is there anyone with a question or a feedback in the chat? Uh, I would like to give a... Um, okay. Suggestion, not a feedback. Okay. Great. Well, I'll come pass out a few cards and envelopes. Uh, I wanted to share something, may I?
I didn't mention this, but I'm not going to be reading any of the cards. I definitely should have said that. So go ahead and seal them. <laughs> this is purely for you, right? This is a reminder for you. Seal them up, put your and put your address on the address in the address area. Farmbasededucation.org. Yeah. Yeah. There is a workshop coming up um, at Shelburne Farms October 23rd through 25th. Yeah, it's a two and a half day workshop where you come and you stay at the inn at Shelburne Farms and we run through activities and eat good food together and have a lot of time to think about your programs and program design. So that happens twice a year, once in um, October and once in March. And so the next one is October 22nd or 23rd. Um, it is a workshop where you um, go to shelburnefarms.org and look for registration. Registration is probably opening tomorrow or Monday. The website is um, shelburnefarms.org. Yeah, shelburnefarms.org. And I'll link to it as well through the Farm Based Education Network. But it's a wonderful, really fun program. Thank you all so much. Great to meet you all.